Today, we discuss Miro. Listen, when it comes to running client workshops, the dream, of course, is to get those creative juices flowing, right? But typically what ends up happening is thousands of hours get wasted because of poorly facilitated meetings. So I have Maya with me today. She's a consultant who runs Fortune 100 workshops from leadership training to team building, and she has the insider tip on what makes things work. Maya? Thank you, Jason. I've been doing this a long time. My number one tip is to bring everyone into that visual collaboration platform. So personally, I use Miro and it's completely changed how I interact with the room. You have to give people a way to feel like they're in the room, even when they're not. That's something you can do easily in Miro. Otherwise, they've seen the same slides and format a thousand times. Falling asleep, eyes glazing over, yawns, all that. Exactly. When people follow me on the Miro board, everyone is literally going on a journey with me. We're adding thoughts, we're reacting, and we're voting for the best ideas. It's great. Connective magic. I like it. That's M. M-I-R-O.com. Hello and welcome back to Humans of Speedway. In this episode, I'm chatting with one of British Speedway's real stalwarts. You could call him Mr. Berwick, but Dennis McCleary has dedicated over 50 years to helping run Berwick Bandits, beginning in 1969 and still going. He started as announcer, his voice is still keeping the Shield Field crowds informed in 2021. He's also been programme editor, co-promoter, team manager, timekeeper, in fact, most jobs other than actually riding the bikes. And during that time, hundreds of riders have come and gone, countless managers, numerous promoters, even a change of speedway track. But Dennis has been a constant rock has witnessed the entire journey. In addition, during the 1970s, he became a qualified referee and ruled over some of Speedway's biggest names of that era. And in 2012, he became a co-promoter and helped bring some of Speedway's stars of the modern era to his corner of Northumberland when the track became licensed for FIM events. And also in 2012, he was invited to be the official timekeeper at the British Speedway Grand Prix in Cardiff. It's a true life in Speedway. He's here to tell us all about it in his own words. Please welcome to Humans of Speedway, Dennis McCleary. Hello, Ian. Thanks very much for having me on. No, thanks for uh, taking the time to, to speak with us. And I, I know a lot of people are, are looking forward to, to hearing your your tales and, and your story. Let's start at the very beginning then. What, what's your earliest memory of, of Speedway and how, how did it first come into your life? Well, television Speedway was really all I had seen before Berwick opened in 68. I'd seen, you know, the Wills Internationale, et cetera, on BBC and I think Alan Weeks used to do the commentary but I hadn't seen live Speedway until Danny and Liz Taylor brought it into Shieldfield in 68 and it was obviously quite a, a brand new sport for the area and um, huge crowds in the early days so I went along to the first meeting in May 68 which was against uh, Newcastle Colts which which was really was to become the Nelson team I think and um, as you know yourself when you're involved in Speedway um, it does get a hold of you, and uh, <laughs> I certainly took to it straight away and um, hadn't given any thoughts to be involved, um, really just went as a spectator, but um, things developed from there, Ian. That's that's a very similar story to, to many that I've spoken to. The, you go along once or twice, and before you know it, you're, uh, you're hooked, and, and try as you may uh, to, to escape it from your life. It, it, it's never really possible, is it? No, it isn't, and I mean... I was I was doing the PA for the football club at the time, which wasn't a great job. It was just simply giving the teams out. You know, we didn't give scorers like they do nowadays, etc. And um, one of the directors at Berwick Rangers was a chap called Charlie Ingpen, and he was clerk of the course for the Speedway. And um, they they had a chap uh, called Bill Hope, who was um, a local plumbers merchant, and uh, he. Um, he was doing the PA for the Tweedside Sports at Lathicus and Cycling, which was held once a year at Shieldfield. And he did the Speedway when it first started. But I think it, Bill just felt it was a fill-in role, you know. And um, Charlie Ingpen came to me and said, do you fancy giving it a go? So I did a couple of meetings in 68 and then took over in 69. 
um, as track announcer. Um, Danny Taylor had sadly passed away and, and Liz and Ken took it over and they got me in to help doing the program as well. So I was doing the announcing and the program. I mean, programs in the early days were not what they are now. You know, you're looking at probably eight pages in those days. But in 1970, just to go back to what you were saying, um, the manager at Berwick Rangers, a chap called Harry Melrose, player manager, had played at quite a high level for Dunfermline and Aberdeen. And um, I got friendly with him, and he asked me if I'd come in and work as assistant secretary, which I did in 1970, and basically to work on the football admin side. They had an, a company secretary at the time who was looking after the other side of the club's business. So I got involved with Berry Rangers in 1970, and give or take a couple of short spells away from the club, I'm still with them as football secretary. Here we are in, what, 2021? Yeah, it's a, it's a, a cracking history of uh, you know the sporting teams in Berwick because they're both very much uh, uh, teams that are at the centre of the community, aren't they? Berwick, a very small and reasonably isolated town, I suppose, in the scheme of, of the whole of the UK. But uh, those sports, you know, Speedway and, and football, both now, of course, at the same location again, um, a, a, a focal point for people to get together when, when of course, we're allowed to do that. Yeah, very much. And I mean, they have had uh, history in the past, as you know. In uh, 1980, there was a bit of a bust up and the, the bandits were forced out of Shieldfield then. But things today are, are very harmonious. The two clubs get on very well. Uh, the two, the promotion of the Speedway, Jamie and Scott Courtney, Gary Flint, Stevie Dews, they get on well with the Berwick Rangers board, work well together and long may it continue. Absolutely. Well, let's go back to those early days then in the early 70s. What were your, you've sort of alluded to some of your duties, but what's your earliest memories of the, the work that you, you started doing at, at Berwick once you'd crossed that, uh, that divide, if you like, from being a, an interested fan to, to being part of the club? It, it was pretty straightforward, to be honest. I mean, I didn't do anything behind the scenes, if you like. I mean, the programme, as I said to you, was pretty easy to do. I had a couple of local lads used to help me with bits and pieces, quizzes and things. But, I mean, basically, I, I did the averages as well for, for Liz Taylor. It was like a week-to-week averages basis. So you were changing virtually every week. You know, you were having to do your, your one to seven and and put it in place for the following week. Now, of course, it's monthly with the Speedway averages changing so uh, there was a lot of work I used to keep the averages up to date for Liz and um, and then she would give me the teams you know maybe on a Tuesday and so they could slot into the program um, if she was changing her riding order she'd give you the visiting team and um, we had a local printer then Howard Blackhall and it was easy enough to just nip in but there wasn't any computers then either you know you yeah. weren't doing things by email or, or or words you know Microsoft Word it was all uh, handwritten stuff you know so you were actually literally handing in the program handwritten or if you had a typewriter type in it and uh, the pictures that you got um, were, were uh, actual photographs you know hard copies yeah um, that was everything now of course in my days doing the bandits program when I was doing it it was all done uh, digitally and electronically yeah, times have certainly changed on and on many fronts, and um, program preparation and production, I imagine, is um, is certainly one of them that's uh, seen the benefits of of technology helping out with things. Oh, very much, and I mean the Bandis program over the last few years has taken off. It's it's probably one of the best in the country. Um, I'm 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 helping out still behind the scenes and doing a little bit, but I gave up um, <clears throat> editing it a couple of years ago. Um, uh, George Dodds, who was a journalist, took over. The, uh, he's done a great job. But I mean, Scott designs the program. Scott Courtney with with Kurt Sport, and um, it, it is a first class program. And I mean, you're looking at 36 pages. You know, um, going back to the days of eight. Uh, yeah. it, it's a, there's a lot of work involved. You know, I mean, you, when I was editing it, you, you know, we have a lot of good contributors. You know, um, helping out behind the scenes. You couldn't possibly do it on your own. Uh, you know, five or six good lads helping out behind the scenes and, and ladies as well in the past and you, you have to rely on them and work together to get everything in place for normally for, say the Tuesday Tuesday night to get it into the printer so that you could get the, the proof the first proof back on the Wednesday um, and it would go to bed on the Thursday morning get printed and rode it up from the West Midlands area where where Curtis and XL are, and it would come up by road up to uh, to Dumfries, and then across country on the on the Friday afternoon to Berwick, um, all boxed up, ready for the Saturday meeting. And over the years, to be fair, we we were always able to get a program on time, you know. 
A tricky one with a program as well, because riders, of course, are are liable to change sometimes last minute, you know, especially if they become injured or for for whatever reason, you know, you're always uh, hoping that you've got the the right lineup in uh, in print, I guess, for for the uh, for the program. But things are out of your hands quite a bit, aren't they? They are. I mean, obviously, teams are supposed to be declared by the Tuesday. Both teams are supposed to liaise and declare the teams on the Tuesday for the Saturday fixture. But uh, if there are injuries or illnesses, obviously things are allowed to change. But if that's the case, you would just change the team on the night. Mm. You know, people would have to change it uh, physically on the night in the programme. You know, the referee would be made aware of the situation. Um, Referees have to be given the teams as well now. On, on a special website prior to turning up for the meeting. Gone are the days when they turned up and just saw the team on the night. Now it's all sent through to them during the week so they can check the averages, check the riders are eligible, etc. Uh, and if there are late changes, uh, obviously the referee is the man who has to approve it. If he's got a problem, he would consult whoever the the BSP member on duty is that weekend to get a heads up, you know. How has things changed since back in the days when you began to, to now because there there was a, probably a lot more attention paid to who's got the right licenses and, and the right um, work permits and permissions and things than perhaps maybe used to be in the olden days. Yeah, massively. I mean, the thing is your teams have to be approved by the BSPA. I mean, when I was co-promoter, I, I did the team declarations. Um, so if you were changing your team for whatever reason, you would submit that team there's a special form you use that would go into the BSP office. They would then submit that to the management committee um, to check it and it would be approved or not approved, as the case may be. But um, then you get an email back confirming your team. Um, you have to declare your averages as well when you put your team in. It would have to meet the criteria, whether it be 42 or 41 and a half. So if you're redeclaring your team, you have to you have to keep within the um, the, the averages. Um, there was a there was always a possibility that uh, if you were over the averages, say at the start of the season your team met the 42-point um, criteria, uh, if for whatever reason your averages improved, say your team became 45 for the seven riders, you are allowed to change your team as long as the man you're bringing in, the rider you're bringing in, has a lower average than the rider he's replacing. So that way you could then redeclare your team, albeit at a higher point than it was at the start of the season, if you follow where I'm coming from. Yeah, and rules and things like that, you're no stranger to, because um, a few people will remember you from the 1970s, because you were a referee in the mid-1970s. Um, tell us about that, because obviously becoming a referee then, very different to, to how it was now. How did it all come about? And tell us about your time in the referee's box. It was easier, can I say then, to what it is now, for the, for the referees to... Um, to train, you know. I mean, I had no intentions really to become a referee, um, but sitting beside the referees, as you do as an announcer, um, they were were looking for young blood and I was was younger and keener, you know, and and two couple of referees in particular, who both are sadly no longer with us, David Miller, who came from Tyneside, as did Dr. Lewis Jameson, who was a GP in in Wall's End. They, They were the two that really pushed me to put my name forward for training um, and I think it was Dick Brasher who was with the SCB or the ACU at the time and Anne Gillespie was in charge of the office and particularly the referee side of it at the BSPA. Um, they, they got me involved and, and, and I filled the paperwork in which was just basically a, a form giving all your details and what experience you had in the sport. That would be around about 72-73 and um, I did I did a year of second halves, mostly at Berwick, with the referee. You know, when when you had the 13 heats as they were then, you always had a, a junior scurry or something and a rider of the night, three heats in a final. So I used to take charge of those and did that for a, for a season. And then in 74, st- continued down that road and then I was given three tests. That's what you got then. And, and I did three referee tests with, with a referee at, um, at Sunderland, Bellevue and Sheffield. Um, I, I did the first test with David Miller at the, the East Bolton Greyhound Stadium. Sunderland were running then. Newcastle had stopped for five years. And the second test was 
was at the old Hyde Road Stadium at Manchester, was which was a, a Sunderland one to go back was a KO Cup tie against Teesside very early in the season uh, in April. The second test was at Bellevue, uh, which was a, a, a what's called in a British League match against Hackney. Um, that was in the August. And the last test, to be fair, was the easiest uh, because it was the Bass Yorkshire Open Championship at Owlet and Sheffield with John Whitaker. And that was obviously an individual meeting. Um, but I had a three man runoff for that one. It was uh, Peter Collins, Soren Austin, and Dave Jessup. Uh, yeah. They all I think they all finished on twelve or thirteen points. Um, Peter Collins won that runoff, but it was it was a pretty straightforward meeting to run. Um, the Sunderland one, I remember going back to that one. Um, it was uh, it was obviously a local derby. Sunderland got beat forty one thirty seven in that one by Teesside in the first leg of the KO Cup. And I can remember in Heat 2, my second race, I had all four reserves down on the track at different times at different corners. And you were trying to keep pace with who was up first and who was down first. It ended up with, with Alan Emerson and Tony Swales getting a 5-1 for a Teesside in that heat. Eventually, there was one finisher for um, for Sunderland, and it, it was the late Vic Harding, actually, who ended up in third place. And the other rider for Sunderland who didn't finish was called Paul Callaghan. So that was the three tests I did, and I um, eventually got told over the winter that I had gained a licence, so I must have done okay. Absolutely. And so you've got the referee's licence in your hands. You, you're good to go there. What happened then? You, you let loose on the league. What, what, what was next? Yeah, I was let loose, as you say, in, in 1975, and um, straight in, uh, I got the first meeting back at Newcastle when they reopened the doors uh, in, at Easter. It was the end of March in '75. It was a time a Tyne Tees trophy against Teesside and um, Newcastle won 48-30. Newcastle had a great side in 75-76 era. You know, you had Tom and Joe Owen spearheading that team. They had a lot of good Australians, Ron Henderson, Robbie Blackadder, Phil Michael Edies. They were really strong at home. Um, well, that was the first meeting. But the, the ironic thing was um, I, we had moved down to Ashington at the time. I was working for the Wandsburg Council in, in sports and leisure at Newbigin Sports Centre, so that was a short time when I wasn't at Berwick Rangers. And um, in the morning, we were about, about 20 miles, maybe not even that away from the track, I got a phone call in the morning of, of that match from from the ACU, I think, I think it was Dick Brasher. There was concerns about the kerbs, being, some of them being laid pointing outwards, um, and there was also a hump at the starting gate. Um, I don't know how he'd got the report, but he said to me, can you get yourself down there before lunchtime and check the track? And if there's any concerns about the the curbing and uh, the inner edge, you'll need to call the meeting off, postpone it. And I think, well, they were expecting about 8,000 in for that meeting, which I think they got from memory. And I'm thinking, I'm going to be the bad one here, <laughs> calling the meeting off. <laughs> However, uh, as push comes to shove, it, everything was fine. The, the curbs were fine. The track was fine. And, and we ran the meeting, and uh, it was pretty easy meeting to referee because everybody was desperately happy to get get a good night and get it over with easy. And we had match races as well that night. Ivan Major was riding; he beat Jimmy McMillan in some match races. So, so that was the first meeting, and I'm sitting thinking, "Oh, this isn't too bad." And then um, the quote phrase, "All hell let loose at Teesside on the Thursday night afterwards in the league match." <laughs> what happened in that one? Well, it was it was Workington in a league match. Um, that was about four nights later, and um, it, you know, Lighton was never brilliant, as you know, at some of the tracks. And this was still in the early, excuse me, the early part of April, so it was, it was getting still pretty dark quickly. Um, I had a situation in, in one of the early races um, when Stevie Watson, who was riding for Workington. A sort of locked horns with Pete Redding of, of of Middlesbrough or Teesside going down the back straight, which is the worst possible place for a referee to make a decision without the, the benefit of what they have now, you know, um, replays. Yeah. And the two of them crashed into the, the what would be the third bend fencing, and I, I honestly hadn't a clue who was to blame. Um, so after a while, I decided to contact the announcer, who was Bernard Gent. He was in a separate box, and just say, look out. I want you to explain that the referee can't can't decide who was to blame, and he's prepared to let all four riders back in. I think it was on the opening lap, 
and uh, I never heard a, I never heard a peep from the pit, so they must have all been happy about that one. Yeah. <laughs> and later in, later in the meeting, it was pretty close, and it was going towards the last heat decider, heat twelve or thirteen. Um, Bruce Forrester, who was captain of Teesside and pretty strong at home, uh, and Malcolm Mackay were vying for the lead, uh, coming around at the last bend, and, and Malcolm Mackay, Australian rider for working, came down, and uh, I just awarded the race. Never gave it a thought, excluded Mal Mackay. Next thing I saw, uh, I heard the crowd first of all roaring. Here he is charging over the centre green, right in amongst the crowd, and up into the referee's box to, to, to complain. The first thing I said to him was, um, Now, uh, Malcolm, before you speak, there's a lady in the box telling him, I want you to curtail your language. <laughs> <laughs> But he was saying, um, Quote, Bruce Forrest, I took my leg away. And I said, Well, I, I can't see how you did because he, you were on the inside. So I find it difficult to agree with you that he took your leg away. Okay, if he'd been on the inside coming through. Um, so I just left it at that. And, uh, well, of course, the crowd were baying at him when he went back down into the stand. <laughs> so that was the second meeting. But but going back to the, the opening meeting in Newcastle, a lot of the fans will remember, uh, in the early days, Newcastle's referees box was, was where where um, the announcers, where Barry Wallace's announcers box is now on the first bend. So you weren't in line with the tapes. The tapes were, what, 30, 40 yards to your left behind you. So the difficulty was, if you had a tape touch, well, it was tape breaking then, if you had a tape breaking or whatever, or a close finish, you were, you were relying on the timekeeper who was in the box right on the finishing line um, to give you the benefit of the doubt, you know. And um, it was never easy to control from that box and, and you had spars on the side of the the glass on the side of the box which made it difficult to pick up the first bend. Nowadays at Newcastle the the referee sits in the, the same box as the timekeeper instant recorder right on the start line, you know. But it was difficult in those days and you had one or two dodgy decisions to make, you know. Um, yeah. if things didn't go quite the way, particularly one of the clubs Thought it should go. I know on the subject of tape touching, it's something that comes up regularly uh, on this podcast whenever we've talked about you know rules and things like that. And um, it seems to be the problem that no one really has the solution for, apart from removing the tapes in terms of uh, you know improving the starts of Speedway. But in the era that you were refereeing, you know the moving around was was pretty commonplace, wasn't it? Well, there was no tape touching in those days, as you know. It was it was breaking of tapes, so you had riders, and there were some masters at it. I can tell you, who who pushed the tapes, roll back, pushed the tapes, roll back. So you had to try, and you're watching four riders at the same time. You had to try and make sure um, nobody got an ult ultimate flyer, you know. And they were they were all good at it, Ian. Um, there was some better than others who could push the tapes and just get that start, you know. Um, the only way you excluded them was if they actually broke the tapes, uh, which happened, of course, at times, you know, but it made it difficult. And um, you had some, I remember a test match at um, Workington when um, I was doing a test match the first season I was on. It was England, Australasia. Uh, so you had an Australian and New Zealand combined team, and I excluded Jack Millen, the late Jack Millen, who had a bit of a, a reputation, as you know. Um, <laughs> I threw him three times for tape breaking that night in the test match. <laughs> and to be fair to him, he never said a word. <laughs> <laughs> fair cop. <laughs> yeah, fair cop. He, I don't think he could complain, really. I never had I never had to exclude him for anything else, I hasten to add. <laughs> yeah, I suppose. But it still happens now, though, doesn't it? And I suppose it's now it's more dropping the clutch and anticipating the start rather than... Uh, obviously rolling because obviously you've got to stay still much more now yeah. but um, do you think that's improved the situation? It's it's certainly better starts no there's no question you still, you still get the odd occasion uh, I mean I see them sitting beside the referees the very I mean it's not always their fault it happens um, you get certain riders who are adapted just getting that little jump you know but most of the times it gets pulled back as you know yourself you see it on TV Um, the ideal scenario would be to have a start gate like you have in horse racing, the flat horse racing, where they go into like a box, mm. and so there's a gate shut behind them. You know, um, it's never going to happen, I don't think. You know, but it would be it would be a situation if you could, if somebody could come up with a situation or a, an idea, I should say, where they could develop a, a gate coming up behind them as well, 
so that they were boxed in and couldn't couldn't move backwards. You know, I mean, you, you know, you see the start and stalls in horse racing where they're locked in, so they they can't get flyers. You know, and nothing can happen until that front front box opens. Sort of modify I mean, so many um, so many speedway tracks at Greyhound stadiums. They could modify the the Greyhound box somehow, make it a bit bigger. Yeah, well, that's that's <laughs> a sort of idea would work. I think if it was properly done. But <laughs> I suppose again, it's all down to cost and how how it would it be adapted, you know. But I think the situation now with starts is much much better to what it was in my days as refereeing, you know, because you you had some horrendous starts, you know, honestly, you did, and I was probably guilty as well. And um, what sort of things did uh, did referees get up to in that era? Because we hear about riders um, maybe being a bit tricky, but I, I mean, referees have their own quirks as well, don't they? Yeah, I mean, to be fair, you, the rule book probably wasn't as difficult as it is now for referees because there's so much else going on now with health and safety and referees inspecting this and inspecting that. When I used to go, you used to simply just go down to the pits, check check the riders were all there. Speak to the team managers, um, the machine examiner, uh, if he was happy, and then you just walk the track and just give the track a check, you know. But, I mean, in my days when I was refereeing, you had some of the, the great names of refereeing. You know, you had like people like Arthur Humphrey, um, Stan Green, Arthur Mellors, um, Bob Owen, um, Leo, Leo Pendergast took me for my second test at, at uh, Bellevue, um, I think. Leo could have been from the Welsh area, and as I said, John Whitaker. Um, yeah. John was refereeing for a long, long time, and then became clerk of the course at Sheffield for many years. You know. Yeah, I used to see him sitting on the at the pit gates until he's uh, obviously he's retired from that now, hasn't he? But um, yeah, I mean, John yeah. will be. I don't know what age John would be. I mean, John would be a fair age, you know. And, he, he was in at Sheffield for a long, long time as clerk of the course. Like you say, he doesn't he doesn't do it now. But um, I used to get on great with John. But um, n- I never really had never really had a problem with riders. Um, you get more problems with team managers, to be honest, as you can imagine. <laughs> you know, I, I got a minus nothing one night at Newcastle. The referees used to get marked in those days. You know, for out of ten. Right. Um, yeah, I got a ten. I had a great relationship with Peter Thorogood, who was Crayford manager at the time. I, I seem to have Crayford quite a bit up north. I think I had them three times up north, and uh, I always got on well with with Peter. And he used to come on the phone and congratulate you on a good meeting, particularly when he won. Um, and he, he said, "Oh, I've given you a ten tonight," you know. And then I had um, I had crew at Newcastle one night. Newcastle were invincible at home, and it, it was a soaking wet night, terrible conditions. Newcastle won really comfortably as as they did in those days. They probably got over fifty points and out of thirteen heats and uh, and I I got I got told that I was getting a minus nothing from the referee for my performance and I, and I was trying to think what I'd done wrong, you know, because it was <laughs> it was a one sided meeting and I don't think crew really had a chance of winning it. But so he used to get marked, you know, um from from the uh, from the, the team manager. So if you if they had a good night, you would get a good mark. If if they had a bad night, you'd probably find yourself getting nothing. <laughs> so yeah. I refereed I refereed mostly at at Newcastle, Middlesbrough, and, and Workington. And I did some couple of open meetings at Berwick. I never I never did league meetings at Berwick. I specifically asked not to be given league meetings at Berwick. Yeah, but sure. I did like sort of the Tweedmouth Feast Trophy. Danny Taylor Memorial Trophy, Festival Trophy, things like that, you know, when it was an individual meeting. Yeah. But I seemed to have a season ticket for Workington. Nobody seemed to want to go there. Um, I had a lot of meetings at Workington, 75, 76. Uh, I was there quite a lot. And those days you didn't have mobile phones either. So we were that year we were living in Ashington. Um, I remember one Friday night I, I drove all the way across the 69, which was the the road we used to go over to Carlisle and then down to Workington for a match against Eastbourne. Got all the way to the track and the meeting had been rained off two hours earlier. Oh, man. <laughs> so there's no way of contacting you. So th- I was told when I got there, it was um, it was Alan, the late Alan Middleton, he said, well, we're going to rerun it on Sunday because Eastbourne were going to Paisley on the Saturday night. And um, he said, can you come back on Sunday? So I had to trail all the way back on Sunday for an afternoon meeting with Eastbourne. It was a dust bowl. It had gone from a soaking wet Friday night to a dust bowl on the Sunday. <laughs> so, like I say, Workington, I seem to referee a lot at Workington. I had the first ever dead heat at Workington against Scunthorpe. Um, 
I remember um, working were really strong at home. Scunthorpe were, were starting to get together a decent side. And I, I said to the late Alan Middleton, who was team manager working at the time, Alan was driving the tractor. He said, oh, I'm just going to, I'm just going to be doing the track rain tonight. And he said, I'm pretty confident we'll win this one. I said, oh, watch yourself. They're not such a bad side. They're, they're coming on. And as it happened, they, they won the match, Scunthorpe, 41 and a half, 36 and a half. And Ken McKinley was their top scorer. He got a maximum. And the next night, would you believe, he went to Paisley. They were going up to Paisley, and he got nothing the next night on, on a track not dissimilar to working mm -hmm. around a, what was a football pitch at Paisley. So I had a dead heat um, midway through the meeting for second place. Uh, that would be in July 75. Uh, Keith Evans of Scunthorpe dead heated with Mick Newton of working for second place. And none of the fans were happy. It was a difficult one to call because one rider crossed the finish line in gate one and the other in gate four. So they weren't close together in that respect. And not, nobody was happy. And one of the working fans came on, put the evening paper up, pinned it up in front of the box so I couldn't see out. <laughs> and um, the, <laughs> the Scunthorpe team manager um, was on the first bend and he came running up the starting gate once I'd, the result had been announced. And he came on the phone and I said, now, before you say anything, you were on the first bend, so you, you couldn't tell who had who'd finished second. He said, no, I'm just going to tell you, ref, the starting marshal reckons my man got it. <laughs> <laughs> of course he does. <laughs> <laughs> so it was, it was 36 and a half, 41 and a half, that one. So that was that was Workington. So I had a lot of meetings at Workington. Um, happy days in 76. I had I remember one meeting at, at Newcastle. Um, it was a bank holiday Monday against Coatbridge. I was held up before the bypasses at Annick and Morpeth on the A1, folks that will know that area. And I was I, I got stuck in heavy heavy traffic. I had to phone the track and tell them I was going to be very tight for the start. And I actually missed heat one. Um, Alan Butterfield, who was a former Newcastle Diamonds rider, was training as a referee at the time. And um, he, he did heat one. So I managed to get in to, to get the start of heat two. And the following week, I remember Ian Thomas, who was running the castle at the time, he put it in the program that he was reporting the referee for being late. And, and the referee was David McCleary. He couldn't even get my name right. <laughs> Who's he? <laughs> <laughs> so that was 75, 76 refereeing. This is Humans of Speedway. I'm Ian Brannan in conversation with Dennis McCleary. After this little short break, we're going to be back with Dennis talking about uh, him going back to being the announcer at Edinburgh and um, in much uh, more recent times becoming a co-promoter and bringing some of Speedway's stars of the moment to his corner of Northumberland. All on the way on Humans of Speedway. You're listening to Humans of Speedway, which is now part of the Sports Social Podcast Network, the UK's first dedicated sport podcast network. Loads of other great shows that you can check out alongside ours. How about the MLS UK show, if you like your soccer stateside? Fan of the Green Bays? What about the Snooker Scene podcast? Or indeed, Fancy a Flutter, looking for some tips? There's three guys that can help you out in the Trampled Bet podcast. There's loads more to check out besides at sport-social.co.uk. Right now on Humans of Speedway, we're back to our conversation with Dennis McCleary because he spent over 50 years involved in Speedway. And uh, in the 1970s, he was a referee, but he was lured back to the centre green, not at Berwick, but at Edinburgh, and uh, Dennis, it, it meant that you had to get yourself a bit of a stage name, didn't it? Yeah, well, I hadn't I hadn't planned to really at the time. I was still officially a referee in 77, but um, out of the blue, um, well, well, Edinburgh Monarchs had reopened at Powder Hall, and um, I went to the first meeting. Berwick were riding in the first meeting in a challenge match, and uh, the Monarchs had a... Uh, a chap doing the announcing, I, I, I think he was called Chris John, he was with Radio 4th, and um, during the week I got a phone call from from Bill Bridget, who was co-promoter at Edinburgh at the time with Mike Parker. Uh, I think Mike Hunter, who knew me, who's obviously still with the Monarchs, had, had mentioned my name to him. They were looking for somebody to step in uh, to cover the second meeting as announcer because Chris couldn't do it, and uh, Bill said, would you like to come up and... Uh, help us out. I know you're a referee, but would you like to help us come up and do the meeting uh, the second night? Uh, so I went up on the Friday night and did the meeting, and it seemed to go down really well. So Bill phoned me back the following week and said, 
book, would you fancy doing it every Friday night for us? Um, it went down really well with with the fans as well, and obviously somebody that knew knew the sport on the PA, you know. And um, I said, well, I'm still officially a referee. He says, oh, we'll put your name down different in the program. <laughs> <laughs> so the, 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 I was in the program for, for that season as Dennis Graham. Ah, is <laughs> um, that your stunt name? Yeah, well, Graham's obviously my eldest son who does the speedway videos, etc. You know, and uh, yeah. so I just stuck with that, and then I changed to Dennis McCreary the year after because I'd given up my referee's license by then. <laughs> so I did. I did the opening meeting at Glasgow as well when they opened at Showfield in '88. Uh, um, Dick Barry and, and Neil Grant were running the show for Jimmy Beaton, the late Jimmy Beaton, and they asked me if I would do the first two or three meetings for them. To get get them going, you know, at Shawfield, they were getting huge, huge crowds at Shawfield, and I've got to say, when they opened that meet, o- opening meeting that night at Shawfield, one of the best promoted meetings I've ever seen. Um, you know, huge crowd. I mean, similar to what Newcastle got that opening night in '75. We've spoken about the importance of having a well-presented meeting before on other episodes I've done, both with riders. I know Shane Parker mentioned it. Um, Neil Machins talked about it. Phil Morris has talked about it, having a well-run meeting and, and good presentation is almost as important as having a decent team because you've got to engage the fans with the action and, and with the occasion and, and create that excitement. That's your job as, as an announcer. It's very, very important. What's, what's, the, what's the trick? What's the magic? Because you've been doing this for over 50 years. You keep getting asked back to big meetings even now. What's the secret, do you think, Dennis? You have to... I find a lot of people get too close to a microphone and you have to keep that certain distance away from the microphone in to get it to be clear and concise. You have to lift your voice decibels to what you would normally do. Um, you have to be you have to try and think ahead before you speak. I know that's difficult at times, but you have to try and um, just think now what am I going to say before you say it, you know? Yeah. Because I've been to tracks where announcers have put their foot in it and they've, they've upset people, but maybe not deliberately. You know, I've done it myself. I've I've said something and then afterwards, oh, goodness, I wish I hadn't said that now. Um, you must try and be totally unbiased. Um, it is difficult when it's your home track, uh, but it is in the SCB rule book that the announcer must be impartial at all times. Really? So you, right. No matter what you might think about the result of a meeting or what's happened or a referee's decision, um, you just have to, you just have to bite the bullet and um, be clear, concise. Make sure you give the result because that's happened before to me. I've forgotten to give the result, um, <laughs> or forgotten to give the time. And rest assured, the fans around you will soon tell you. Um, oh, you can't, you can't forget to give the time. Oh, there's oh, no, ructions if no, you do that. Time's important, yeah. <laughs> especially if it's a track record. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that, that's the basis of it. Um, also, I, you have to prepare. Um, I, I tend to take a lot of notes around with me. You might not use them all, but but fans like to hear little bits and pieces about, particularly the visiting team. You know where they'd been the night before, what the result was, who scored the points. Um, looking ahead to the following week, who were racing the next week, who, who was going to be coming in the team for the visiting team, um, or if the bandits were going to be away during the week, uh, where we were going to be. Um, keep an eye on the, the updates, etc. Um, if there were going to be top visiting riders coming, you know, you try to boost boost that meeting up. Uh, no matter who was you were riding against, you had to try and boost that meeting up the following week, you know. So be clear, be concise. Try not eat the microphone. Um, be impartial and do some homework. So th- yeah. those are the the jobs I've tried to find. Um, time to do if you like during the years I've been an announcer and and really too you, you probably earn your your money at the point where the excitement's not required when you've got an awkward situation you've got a bad crash and yeah. you're trying to reflect the the mood but also keep people informed as well that's right I mean the good thing is if you've got a good centre green man working with you who knows the ropes um you know, Steve, Steve's done it, Beric, Steve Hayward, who's, who helps in the box now, and, and Dick Barry's done it for donkey's years, you know, and um, they tend to come in straight away at the end of the, the race mm. um, 
and give a little bit boost to whatever's happened. Um, so then you you just come in and, and do what's necessary, you know. Um, uh, try not try not get involved in saying what's happened or what what you think might have happened in that race if they have. Like as you say, if there's been a nasty crash. I remember one night at Powder Hall, um, I couldn't speak because I thought I thought Eric Broadbelt was really really seriously injured. Um, he, he he came off on the second bend and. And, and flew into the, one of the lamp standards, you know, because mm. obviously it's a greyhound track as well. So you had the poles going right round, and you know, I'm thinking, is this lad going to get up from this, you know? And he, you just don't know what to say. Yeah. Luckily, Eric was, was up and about, and he was off the track for a couple of weeks, but he was back, getting the applause of the crowd the next week. And I'm thinking, goodness me, Eric, how did you, how did you get up from that one, you know? And you think, what, what can you say? Speedway riders have. Uh seem to have a habit of bouncing back from sometimes crashes that look spectacular and and often it's the ones that don't look spectacular where they, they sometimes turn out the worst. Oh, I know. You know. We've seen them at Berwick. I mean, Alex Edbert got a very, very bad injury at Berwick one night and um, we've, we, it just he came around eventually but he was, he was really badly hurt and then you, you had the Carlos Villa situation early in 2000 when an innocuous crash, Carlos Miles in front on the last lap, clipped the fence on the back straight, came down and I, th- I think his, his machine followed him down the track and, and struck him, you know, and, and Carlos was paralysed, you know, um, Argentinian. Um, and then you, then you have what happened to Ricky, you know, Ricky Ashworth yeah. with his injury in uh, 2013 um, when Ricky had been with Berwick just over a year. Um you know, and Ricky, we thought, really feared for Ricky, um, but marvellous recovery. I mean, uh, Ricky's obviously not 100%, but my goodness, he uh, he's grafted away there. He's battling, isn't he? Um, yeah. Yeah, and uh, he's been up at Berwick a couple of times, and we've been down to see him, and uh, you take your hat off to him, what he's achieved since that accident. Yeah, it was great to see him back on a... Uh... Uh, you know the push bike when he was riding around the the velodrome in Manchester. You know it was obviously a really big thing for him to to get back on any kind of bike and and show that he's determined to 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 get back as 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 well as he can possibly be. It's um you know it's really good to see that he's he's, uh, he's, he's kind of got a marvelous family behind him as well. You know yeah. and um, he's uh, his spirit is tremendous and uh, he won't let anything knock him down. You're listening to Humans of Speedway. I'm Ian Brannan, and I'm in conversation with Dennis McCleary, who spent over 50 years being involved with Berwick Bandits Speedway. Dennis is going to be telling us about how his dream Speedway meeting would look before the end of this. Um, let's turn to your time with Berwick now, because as I mentioned there, over 50 years, doing all sorts of stuff. You've, you've mentioned you've been involved with the programme um, at Berwick. You've been an announcer, uh, both on the centre green and, and in the box as well. You've been a timekeeper. Um, you've also been a promoter yourself, um, a co-promoter uh, at one point, but you've worked alongside many other promoters in that time. I imagine Sublime to the Ridiculous pretty much <laughs> covers it over that time because there's been some sensational times at Berwick. Um, what are your memories of, of, of working with those various promoters and, and the things that you've been involved in during your more than 50 years with Berwick? I've, I've worked with a lot of promoters at Berwick, you know, the Taylor family, um, Davey Fairbairn, Dick Barry, Ian Graham, um, Mike and Yvette Hope, Peter Waite, um, John Anderson and Linda Waite Consortium, and then John Anderson along with Ryan, his son, and uh, George Hebburn. And uh, I had a, had a spell with, with Scott and Jamie Courtney. Um, and, of course, Terry Linden, who um, who came in uh, for 1990 as promoter uh, without any Speedway background, but had been involved in, in sport in, in Northumberland. He'd, he'd helped think some of the the lower league football teams in in the county, um, the the club looked as if it was going to the wall, um, because Ian Graham had been such a driving force for the club um, uh, and passed away in, in 1989 with after fighting cancer for so long, and he obviously was was a mentor with with Davy Fairbairn and I don't know if Davy ever got over that and um, I mean they had such a good side in 89 I mean they won the KO Cup you know they beat Poole they had a terrific side all seven of them were capable of scoring points you know 
you know, you had Mark Courtney and Dave Blackburn, Andy Campbell, David Walsh, mm -hmm. uh, Rob Grant, you know, Scott Robson, a great, great side. And um, and Davy decided he'd had enough, you know, and uh, the club was up for sale and it went into the new year and eventually um, Terry appeared on the scene and, and took over and in fairness, um, Dick, Dick worked with him as well, and the the the, cl the club were very strong on the track in that in that era. They had a good side uh, even in the year before they went into the top league. Nobody ever expected that to happen, but they went into the top league in in '91, and um, they had a world class team. You know, they yeah. had they, they signed Calvin Tatum and and Jimmy Nilsson and Richard Knight as the three heat leaders. And they they could have won the league that year, but for the injuries to Kelvin and Michael Blixt at Oxford in the Gold Cup final, second leg. And Berwick had won the first leg against Oxford and were comfortably winning the second leg. And um, in Heat 15, an innocuous incident, Michael Blixt collided at the back of Kelvin coming out the second bend of the first lap. And Kelvin went through the fence and and uh, and really hurt himself. And and Michael Blix, who had been signed from Peterborough, and was a real prospect and a half Swedish rider, um, he shattered both his wrists, mm. and and that end, virtually ended his career. I think he made a bit of an a, aborted comeback, but never it never worked for him, and he and he became a involved in the machine side of Speedway. I think he, he was doing Blix carburetors, uh, the last I heard. Mm -hmm. uh, the, I think Berry would have won that, the top league that year. They, they ended the season without those two riders, and the season sort of fell apart a little bit, and um, I just, it just didn't work. But they, they dropped back into what is now the championship league, it was in the second division in 92. But Richard Knight stayed on, and uh, it was a 10-point-plus average rider. And again, they had a very good team in, in 92. They kept a few of the riders who were with them the year before. And they finished runner-up that year. Um, again, they could have won the league. But things weren't happy behind the scenes. And um, uh, and Terry, uh, Terry departed the scene. And um, we looked as if Speedway was lost to Berwick altogether. Um, and 93... They, they weren't in anything, um, but, but Mike and Yvette Hope, uh, who had a garage at Wooler, about 15 miles out of the town, they, 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 um, the bug bit with them and they, they put a committee together and um, we ran a couple of open meetings at the end of 93 at Barrington. They were, they were virtually like National League challenges, if you like, the ones that starts of tomorrow mm -hmm. and arose the Thistle. Joined the Academy League, I think it was called then, in, in 94, and won the league. Were very strong. Kevin Little was spearheading team. Won the Riders Championship. A lot of good young lads coming through. Dave Meldrum was coming through. Gareth Martin. And uh, 95 again, very strong. But um, but Mike uh, and Yvette were, were really keen to get the sport back into Berwick. And um, the piece had been made with the football club. There'd been gr there was greyhound racing at the time, at, at the stadium at Shieldfield. So anyway. the, the noise tests were actually run on the Greyhound track, on the sand. Right. Um, yeah, the council the council came in and, and did the noise test, because as you can imagine, it'd been out of the town for some 16 years. So you, you were going to get opposition, you know, cause the, I don't know if you, if you know Shieldfield, but there are a lot of houses in close proximity to the stadium, you know. Mm -hmm. And, and there, were, there were objections. Um, but however, the, the councils, the, the county and the, the local Berry Council felt it was needed back in the town and, and granted permission. Um, so they had to relay the speed track, you know, and uh, it was the August of 96 before they got up and running again. But they were in. They were still in what was then the Conference League or Academy, where it was called then. Um, and the, and they finished. I think they finished runners up to Linlithgow the first year. We're getting big, big crowds. I mean, nothing like they were getting a Chillfield in the 68, 69 area when you were pulling in three, four thousand. You know, but they were getting. I can remember Linlithgow and the night Linlithgow came down. There must have been well over a thousand there. You know, for what was basically a National League match. Yeah. Well. Um, 
So in, in my company there, took the bandits back into where they are now in 97 and, and also ran also ran an uh, academy team at the same time, you know. So they were running the two teams, um, starting a 13 heat match, maybe say 6 o'clock for the, for the academy team uh, and then bringing in the bandits matches straight after. Um, and that's that went on, and then and Peter Waite took over um, as promoter. Um, that would be in uh, 1989, I think, from memory. Uh, Peter Waite was there for 10 years. Uh, sorry, 1999. I beg your pardon. The years just fly past you, don't they? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it'd be 1999. Peter came in uh, virtually a sole promoter and was there for about 10 years. Um, you know, Peter brought Alan Mogridge back into our level of speedway from, he'd been riding, I think, for Rye House, possibly in the, the lower league. And um, I always said Shieldfield was made for Alan because he could ride the banking like nobody else could, you know. Uh, it was brilliant round Shieldfield, Alan. And then Peter, of course, was responsible for bringing the three Czech riders in, you know, in uh, around the turn of the year, the 1990 era, that would be Michael Makovsky, uh, Adrian Rimmel and Josef France. Um, and, I mean, Pepe France is still riding. He's riding long track um, and he's riding, he's riding in the Czech League. Um, he's still a Beric asset. Is he really? He, still, he gets in the yeah, um, in, in the Grand Prix every now and again, doesn't he? Yeah, he does. And, and, and I mean, when I was involved as co-promoter, we t- try to tempt him back two or three times into, into the Bandits team. But I think his long track commitments at the weekends were just too strong for him, you know? Yeah, no, he's a solid rider because he rode for Sheffield for a while as well, didn't he? And, uh, he... Yeah, he did. He did. And then when Peter decided he'd had enough um, after 10 years, again, the club looked as though it was lost. But um, John Anderson, who had a butcher's business in North Berwick, and his family, and and Linda Waite and her family, Linda ran Cornhill Village Shop and Post Office, they, they combined forces and, and took the club over um, and worked together for a year and a bit, I think, and then Linda stepped back, and um, George Hebburn, who was local builder and Speedway supporter and sponsor, he came involved with, with John and Ryan Anderson, of course, you got involved as a, a co-promoter yourself. You you um, got yourself into the hot seat eventually. I fought I fought against it for quite a while, <laughs> but uh, I did I did eventually uh, knuckle down and and accept the responsibility. John was wanting somebody to come in and, and do the day to day work with basically on the admin side, the, the program, the riders' contracts. Um, Work permits because we had a few work permits at the time. Sponsors, sponsors license, sponsor certificate with the UKVI. You know, we had we had riders from we had Cosa Smith who came in from Australia. We had Jade Mudgeway who's promoter at Redcar now. He came in from New Zealand. Um, we had um, Matty Weathers at the time was a work permit rider who we brought in. So you know we had to be on the ball and 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 John really wanted somebody to look after the admin side, do the work with the BSPA, averages, rules, teams, co- contacting teams, visiting teams, you know, making sure. Mm-hmm. I, I had a good relationship with all the visiting teams. I got on great with Ian Thomas. Um, I know Ian had his quirks, but the late Ian Thomas, but I used to get on great with Ian. Neither Peter or John would, would work with Ian. They left <laughs> it to me. <laughs> but, the peacemaker. Ian, was, Ian was your typical Yorkshireman, but my goodness, he knew how to promote a speedway meeting. And promoting speedway on a local level is one thing, but you were one of the co-promoters at the time when Berwick got the FIM license and you brought international speedway to Northumberland. Some some massive meetings, the World Speedway stars, uh, all there on your doorstep. How did all that come about? Because a major achievement to get those meetings to Berwick. We, we were told, um, we were approached, um, at the time there was a need for another FIM track in Britain. Um, I don't know what happened. Somebody had, had either given up the FIM license or, or had been taken. I'm not sure, but we were asked by um, Alex Harkis, who was president, chairman of the BSPA at the time, would we be interested at Berwick in putting ourselves forward for an FIM track? And uh, we said yes, we would. And uh, we we put the the polyform fence in. It's not an air fence at Berwick. It's a polyform fence. Um, you know, with the they're like um, little balls inside them, you know, mm. 
um, I don't know what you describe them as, but uh, it doesn't collapse, you know, and doesn't yeah. need taken down. And that's um, different from a lot of clubs, though, isn't it? Because most people have the air fence, and so this is, but yeah. this is the other option you're allowed to have. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's it's permanent. It stays up, you know, and um, it's been up for getting on nine nine years now. And um, so we we got the track inspected. I, I, there was a FIM rep came over from Sweden, um, checked the track and measured it and. And lo and behold, they got the license. So um, we're given an FIM license, and um, it was brilliant because, in we had three um, FIM meetings in consecutive years. When we, in in 2012 we had um, Grand Prix qualifier, which Chris Harris won, and and then in in 2014 another qualifier which Lena Sundstrom won. But in between, in 2013. We were asked if we would take one of the rounds of the World Under-21 final, which was a real feather in our cap. It was the second of the three rounds. And uh, those that were there will remember this meeting because it was probably one of the best meetings ever at, at Shieldfield. Uh, I mean, you had some crack lads riding. Um, I mean, two of the riders who finished down the field are now two of the top guys in the Grand Prix, um, Patrick Dudek. And Bartosz Schmarzlek, wow. who's not the world <laughs> champion now, they were in that meeting and, and weren't even in the top three. Um, Piotr Pavlici won it, um, though I think Patrick Dudek went on to win the under-21 final that year over the three legs. Um, Kasper Gomolski was second and uh, Vaclav Milic was third. But, I mean, it was a class field. And I remember on the Friday night, um, the, the Polish riders turned up as they do early, uh, you know, three, four, five bikes, some of them, <laughs> it's just kind of stripping their bikes all down and rebuilding them, you know, really top-class professional lads, you know. Yeah. And I'm thinking to myself, you know, that's one of the reasons possibly why they're, they're so strong at that level, you know. And then on top of that, Sky got involved in, in uh, what was the, the Premiership then, you know, Premier League, and, and we had four Sky meetings in four years. 13, 14, 15, 16, you know, and we had Newcastle, Edinburgh, Peterborough and Workington in four matches. We won two and lost two of those. <laughs> yeah. I so, see. I mean, there, there were heady days for the club, you know, and um, busy, busy times, as you could imagine. I mean, putting up putting up a an FIM meeting, there's a lot of work involved, you know. I mean, people don't realise what was going on behind the scenes, you know. You had to get accommodation sorted for riders. You had to get... There was so many staff involved, you know, machine examinations, very similar just to like a Grand Prix, you know. And where do you put up the world's speedway stars when they descend on Berwick? What, what's the uh, what's the accommodation of choice around there? It's, it's surprising. There was there's, there's travel lodges around, you know, and there's um, some just out of the town. And uh, we've got some good people who are involved with the speedway who had who knew the meetings were coming on and 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 kept rooms back, you know. Um, Hotels and guest houses. So we managed lot, some of the riders. Um, I think the practice was on the Saturday. Um, so a lot of them, one or two of them, I should say, more of the, the British based riders just turned up on the Saturday morning, you know, and, mm -hmm. and, and went back after the meeting. Well, one of the meetings rained off on the, on the Saturday night. And because Berwick doesn't have a planning permission for a Sunday, we had to rerun it on the on the Monday, the Monday night. That would be the one that Lena Sundstrom won, a Grand Prix qualifier. A um, couple of the field couldn't couldn't come back for that one, so there was there was a changes to the lineup. Um, but there was a bit of a hoo-ha because some of the boys were riding in Poland on the Sunday, even some of the Brits British lads. Uh, so they had they had to be allowed to to leave and go and ride in their matches wherever they were. And then come back and ride at Berwick on the Monday night. Great times for Berwick. And and do you still have the FIM license? Uh, is there a chance of any more uh, big meetings in, in in the future in Northumberland? You know we haven't got the FIM license now. Um, it, there's a lot of new regulations now. Things would have to be changed. There's, there's a perimeter wall right round the outside of the the polyform fence, and I've got a feeling that might have to would have had to maybe come down now and there's, there's other bits and pieces so I think like Ashfield have got it now I've got the FIM licence I think they're going to be running another Grand Prix type meeting this summer mm -hmm. but you know it was four years of, of that FIM licence it was up for renewal it was a four year licence and uh, 
it was uh, it was worth it, despite the all the work and headaches we had. Yeah, and some great memories from that time as well. And... Yeah, absolutely. And then uh, I stayed on for a year after John packed in and, and worked with Scott, um, Scott Courtney. Him and I worked away together for a year. Um, got on great, had a great relationship. Um, Scott was, was team manager as well. And um, I just felt it was maybe time just to take a step back from, from that side. And um, you need younger blood in as well, which they've got here at Berwick now. You know, you've got Jamie who's the next writer himself, Jimmy Courtney, you've got Scott, Gary Flint, um, who was also team manager and co-promoter, and Stevie Dews, who, who looked after the environmental health side of the club, you know, and um, of course, Gary was was an ex-writer, I think a lot for Stoke in the National League, and now his son Leon's with Berwick. Of course, Leon's going to be involved in the new team, the uh, Berwick Bullets, the new National League team that, um, that Berwick are going to be putting out. Um, a great youth system coming through at Berwick once again. And they also run a Northern Junior League team, which is obviously running normally over four or five heats in the second half. But still, you know, you're getting there's some good young lads coming through that rode for the Border Raiders and that. You know, a young lad, Luke Harrison, who was the 250 champion last year in Britain. He lives down the Scunthorpe area. He comes up and rides for the Raiders. Um, the McGurk family are heavily involved. Um, you know, you've got Harry was riding, um, Sam, um, some, some good lads, and, and you've also got a couple of local lads who've come through the Raiders team, Mason Watson and Kieran Douglas, who live locally. They're both in the new Berwick Bullets team, mm-hmm. who are going to ride in the, the National League there at Reserve. You've also got Greg Blair coming back. Um, Greg did a few amateur meetings last year at Redcar, etc. Uh, rode for Berwick about 10 years ago um, and is the great grandson of the, the Taylors who started Speedway at Berwick in 1968. Really? Wow. Yeah. Uh, Liz and Danny's great grandson. That's a nice little link as well, isn't it, to go back to the, yeah. the early days oh, yeah. of, uh, of, and, of and a lot of talent. Yeah. Uh, injuries knocked his career back at the time, but certainly had heaps of talent. Another nice one for your CV was the the time that you were chosen to be the timekeeper at the British Grand Prix in Cardiff. I think this was 2012, wasn't it? So how did that come about? And what's it like being the timekeeper, knowing that there's 40-odd thousand people in a stadium hanging on your your every uh, your every instruction, really, for what the time is when they write it down in their programme? No doubt me being one of them, I, I expect. That's right. I, um, I've actually been involved in the British Grand Prix three times, although only, only once as, as timekeeper. I wasn't involved. They didn't need an instant recorder. That was done separately. Um, but I was way up in, in the gods at, at the Millennium Stadium, as it was then, with the, with the match referee. Um, I think it was Krista Gardell from memory. Uh, I stand corrected. Um, so there was him and myself and the announcer. And in the box behind you had the jury and... Um, um, People like that who were just keeping a check on things. Mike Postlewhite was involved. Mike Postlewhite was involved. Who was a British referee? They were involved, and uh, Tony Steele. Um, and I, I got a call from Tony in the winter, and he said, "Do you fancy coming down and doing the timekeeping at Cardiff?" So um, yeah, I went down, and uh, we, my son went down, and Graham went with us. We flew down to Cardiff, and uh, we stayed at the the Holiday Inn at Cardiff Airport. I just rented a car and um, I was team managing the bandits and the pairs at Somerset on the night before, Ah. um, on the Friday night. So, um, kill two birds with one stone, if you like. (laughs) um, Yeah, I got a track record as well at at Cardiff. I was going to say, I'm sure the track record went in 2012. Yeah, Nicky Pedersen got it. Yeah. Chris Holder, I'm pretty sure, if my memory serves me correctly, Chris Holder won that meeting. Yes. Um, and and Nicky Nicky broke the track record, and I think it was the second heat. Because I had to, and you know what I did? I, I chickened out a little bit because I was a bit concerned I'd made an error. So so when I came home, we taped the meeting, and I and I ran the race and started my watch and finished it. <laughs> Just to double check. <laughs> and it was she was bang on. <laughs> What's the the dark art then of of being a timekeeper? When do you start your stopwatch, and exactly when do you stop it? Is there is there a particular knack to it? As soon as you see the tape twitch, right? You watch the tape. 
same as the riders do. You know how they turn their heads to the right or left. or yeah. And you, you just watch for that tape twitching. As soon as the tape twitches, you're never going to get it 100%, Ian, as you know. Yeah, yeah. The only way you do that is electronically. And there's always been a hint and speed where that would happen, electronic times for racing. Mm-hmm. Uh, in fact, Tony Steele said to me that year, this could be the last year of, of manual timekeeping, but it's still going on. So, And what you must do, you must you must stop the race before the rider crosses the line. I know that sounds an Irish one, but you've got to remember, by the time you press that button on the watch, he's crossed the line, you know. Yeah. So you, you, you've got to... You've just got to hit it as they're just coming up to the line, you know. And it's a historic job as well because you're overseeing track records too. I've had one or two track records. I had Andrew Silver at Barrington and then Jimmy Nilsson shattered it. Um, and then Craig Cook shattered the one at Shieldfield. But, of course, the track's changed at Shieldfield now. Yes. So there'll be a new track, there'll be a new track record this year. Um, in the British Under-21 final, which was run in October at Berwick. Dan Bewley won it. He he clocked 62.9, which was quite an exceptionally good time. That's on the so that's that's the new track record as we stand at Berwick at the minute, 62.9. Wow! By Dan Bewley. And before we move on to your dream team uh, and your dream meeting, which um, I know I've been saying I'm going to do for about 15 minutes now, but there's so much to to get through and talk about. Where does winning the Jeff Dolby Trophy sit in your achievements because that is a, a huge accolade it's awarded by the referees to um, a different person every year and and it's somebody who um, the referees want to recognize um, almost like a, a lifetime achievement award a contribution award but also for being a, a helpful citizen to, to the sport of speedway as well I suppose as well it's it's a huge accolade within the sport of speedway isn't it yeah very much uh, that was totally out of the blue I mean I, I worked the year I was refereeing, Jeff, the late Jeff Dolby was was a referee, and he's he's good lady put forward the trophy um, after Jeff passed away, to, as you say, to be presented by the referees to whoever they, they like. I think Neil Merchant's won it as well. Yes, he has. Um, yeah. yeah, could beat anybody. And um, the night I got it, um, I was I was doing the timekeeping. Um, I think Steve was doing the announcing. The referee that night was um, was Graham Hunter from Crownlington, and, and, and I saw Willie Dishington, who's also a referee, on the centre green at the interval, um, and, and Graham said to me, oh, you're wanted on the, the centre green, I said, what am I wanted down there for? He says, oh, you have to go down, I said, no, you have me on, you're just pulling my leg, he said, no, 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 you have to go down, so eventually uh, I did go down, and that's what it was, um, Willie was presenting the, the Jeff Dolby Memorial Trophy um, for services to, to Speedway. Over over the fifty years, it was wow. two thousand and nineteen. Yeah, yeah. So uh, kept the trophy. Um, it's, it's handed back now. You know, you you just you had your name on it. It was engraved, um, and then it was handed back. So uh, that was really nice. Yes, and and the the Bandit Supporters Club kindly inaugurated me into the Hall of Fame, um, and, and as did the Berwick Rangers Supporters Club, and. Um, and the Scottish Football League put me into their Hall of Fame the last year of the old Scottish Football League. Um, it was the Iron Brew Lifetime Achievement Award, if what was called a Phenomenal Achievement Award at a dinner in Glasgow. Wow. Again, totally out of the blue. Last award of the night, sitting, sitting, finishing off your dinner, thinking, well, that went quite well. All the players of the year got their awards, managers of the year. And then suddenly... You're called up on the stage <laughs> in front of three or four hundred people. Wow! So that that was another that was another nice achievement. It was nice to get it. I mean, I, you're not in it for that, you know. You're in it to, to because you enjoy doing it. But it was nice to get the award. You're listening to Humans of Speedway. I'm Ian Brannan, and my guest is Dennis McCleary, who's spent over 50 years being involved in Speedway, uh, most of that time with the Berwick Bandits. And next, he's going to design his dream Speedway meeting in our Speedway Paradise feature on Humans of Speedway. 
It's time now for our Speedway Paradise section of Humans of Speedway, something we do in every single episode. And with every guest, we ask the same six questions, all in order to try and get a handle on how their dream meeting would look. So we're looking for the ideal track, the ideal stadium, uh, the dream one to seven. Plus, who would referee the meeting? Which rules would you change and who would be the opposition? It's what we call Speedway Paradise. You can check them out in every single episode that we've done so far and uh, this one is no exception so over to you Dennis if you're designing your dream speedway meeting first of all which track would you choose purely for the shape and the shale and for the racing which track would you be having your dream meeting on well I, I could say Shulfield but I'm going to say Barrington because it was such a unique little track um, but it was obviously built from scratch and it, it was very small but my goodness, the racing around there at times was something else. So I would, I would say, yeah, we'll, we'll run it at Barrington if it was still there. Okay, and then if we're going to put the stadium around it, so we've got the Barrington track, but you can have any stadium to go around it for the for the atmosphere, for for the viewing for the fans. Which which stadium would we put that track in? Yeah, I could I could be very biased and say Shieldfield, which I obviously love, has been part of my life for fifty years, yeah. football and speedway. But I'm going to say Powder Hall which is no longer there mm -hmm. because it's been pulled down and it's housing and business park now. But it was such a such a nice stadium and track. And uh, I love my Friday nights at Powder Hall uh, up in the gods there in the announcer's box. Um, so I would say, yeah, Barrington track built into the Powder Hall stadium. Yeah, because Edinburgh's uh, got a, a rich history of, of Speedway, hasn't it? I know that it's at Armadale now, but they've they've had Powder Hall, they've had uh, Meadowbank as well, haven't they? So many great yeah. stadiums. Marine Gardens. I mean, Meadowbank. I mean, I, didn't, I never went to Meadowbank, but when you see photographs and and um, you see um, video action from there, the crowds were absolutely sensational in the 60s era, you know, when... when the Templetons rode for them, and Bill Landles, and um, Ryder Eyed, uh, Bent Larson, uh, Bent Janssen, sorry, and um, mm. but um, Bert Harkins was riding then, you know. Yes. Uh, yeah, tremendous. Um, I, and of course, Armadale now is is out on the M8, you know. Yeah, it's it's a little bit more out of it, and yeah, Meadowbank, of course, was. It's much more just outside the city centre, isn't it? It's um, more yeah, accessible. well, just just more or less just below where the the Meadowbank Sports Stadium was built for the Commonwealth Games. You know, yes. for 1970, that was one of the reasons they lost the stadium. They put the velodrome in in that area where the speedway was, I think. And um, and now, of course, the Meadowbank Sports Stadium is no is also down now. That are rebuilding that to probably a lesser extent than what it was. You know. I think that that's where Speedway and my family originates from, actually, in Meadowbank Stadium. My grandma uh, grew up in Edinburgh. She's Scottish. She she grew up in Edinburgh. And it was my grandma that took my granddad along. And uh, they used to go to Meadowbank in the 19... Well, probably the 1950s. Yeah. And, I would have uh, loved to see them um, racing at Meadowbank. Uh, I, Mike Hunter kindly sent me a, a DVD down. I said to him, can, is it possible you can send me a DVD of action from Meadowbank yeah. and he did and lo and behold he had forgotten about it but on the very end was the very first ever race at Shieldfield in 1968 wow. Berwick against Newcastle Colts Heat 1 filmed from what is the third bend area banking by a Monarchs supporter Wow so just a little so, bit of extra bonus, bonus footage yeah, but it was uh, so, history We've saved it, obviously, mm. and when the time comes, we're gonna we're gonna put it up, you know. Fantastic. Yeah. Heat one, um, Roy Williams, or and Bernie Lagrosse as he was, um, Roy Williams, Brian Black, five one for Berwick over Dave Schofield and Jack Wynn Stanley for Newcastle. Well, a good way to start at your new stadium. Yeah. They lost the meeting in the end. <laughs> oh, well, yeah. Well, how often do we yeah. see that? Five ones at the yeah. start and nothing at the end. That's right. Well, I don't know if you recall that Murray Burt, who was a Kiwi, I think, from memory, he was riding for Newcastle. He got a maximum that night. So your your dream team then, your your individuals, no no rules, no points, limits or anything like that. So who's going to be riding in your, in yeah, your well, dream I've, team? I've gone, I've gone with... Um, I've taken the easy route... 
and I've gone with the Berwick team and I've basically taken them from the top 10 all-time scorers in Berwick Colours and I've mixed it between the two tracks, you know, Shieldfield and, um, and Berrington. Mm -hmm. Some of the lads will have ridden just the one track, some have ridden two. But I've, I've named an eight-man team, and I hope you don't mind, because I found a great difficulty in, in picking the last rider. Yeah, no, uh, no rules, you're all right, Dennis, you can go for it. Yeah, in no particular <laughs> order. I, I've chosen Michael Mikowski because he's a top point scorer for Berwick all time, Czech Republic. So I've got Michael Mikowski, who leads the way for Berwick all time pop point scorers. Uh, Rob Grant, who was Mr. Berwick, particularly around Berrington, was, uh, took no prisoners on the track, but such a lovely chap off the track, you know. Uh, I could never name a team for Berwick without Rob Grant. Steve McDermott, who came into the Berwick team from Edinburgh, um, under a bit of a cloud, because I think at the time Edinburgh thought he'd been poached by Davy Fairbairn, to the extent that in the program one week, when I think when Berwick were there, they put a cartoon in, um, and it was a Davy, Davy Fairbairn, and out of one pocket was a fish, because Davy was a fisherman, and out of the other pocket was a wad of cash. <laughs> 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 I think that was a hint. <laughs> and Steve was Steve won the um, Riders' Championship for Berwick in '83. Um, I think that would be at Wimbledon. Um, next in line, the late great Wayne Brown, the mighty Atom. Wayne came in as a little boy from New Zealand, uh, hardly five foot, struggled for three years to make any sort of impact, and then suddenly took off. Um, became, in one season, from a four-point rider, a nine-point rider, uh, up to ten, won the Riders' Championship for Berwick in 1980, uh, beat Hackney, I'd imagine, was transferred to Sheffield, uh, eventually gave up Speedway to go back home to New Zealand to concentrate on his, his business, I think his his business. Sadly, lost his life in a works accident um, at a very young age. Wayne Brown would be the fourth rider. Okay. The fifth rider would be Mark Courtney. Um, Mark came in from Newcastle after a for him a poor season at Bruff Park, came into the Bandits team and I've said this all along, there's never been a better rider around Barrington than Mark. Uh, Mark was poorly in motion as if the track had been built for him. Um, never quite got round Shieldfield as well as he did with when he came back to Shieldfield with, I think it was Arena, Arena Essex or maybe Rye House. He, but he could ride Barrington, my goodness could he not. Yeah. Ten-point rider for Berwick that season when they won the cup. Next rider would be Graham Jones again in the top ten all scorers. Graham came in early seventies from uh, from Suffolk. He came up from Lowestoft to ride for Berwick. He'd been riding um, for Boston. Um, maybe did second half of Kings Lynn. Um, rode for Berwick and uh, became captain. Had a testimonial. Big, big point scorer. The next in line more recently would be Kevin Doolan. Yes. Um, Kevin, again, in the all-time top ten scorers. Um, rode for Peter, Peter Waite, in the early 2000s. Uh, and came back to ride for Berwick, finished his career at Berwick. Um, lived in Berwick in the last couple of years. Now back in Australia, back in Adelaide. Um, great team man, great captain. Great with young riders, great in the pits, um, lovely to speak to, um, and became just part and parcel of Berwick Speedway over the last few years. And the other rider I've put in, uh, at number eight, not technically number eight, but he's, he's eight in the list here, it's Adrian Rommel, again from the Czech Republic. Um, sadly, his career was virtually ended with a very bad injury at Edinburgh but became Berwick's number one for several seasons. Moved away to work it for one season, came back, was always a nine or ten point rider. So <clears throat> there's the eight riders, Ian. A great lineup as well, and particularly Kevin Doonal. And uh, I, I remember I mean, you said there he's a great team man, great with it, great with everybody. But I, I, I distinctly remember him a few years ago at uh, at Somerset 
uh, on the pairs the night before the the GP, and uh, his night was over, and um, he'd, he'd taken his last ride, and he came, and I mean, I was stood on the third and fourth bend at Somerset, and he came out, and he was just sat with the Berwick fans having a can of cider. It was just like nice to see he's still there with his uh, with his Kevlar's yeah. like tied round his waist and just enjoying like everybody else. You know, it was, it was great. Yeah, he did that at Sheffield as well when he he had a couple of means riding for Berwick in the Riders' Championship, and he was in amongst the crowd on the. Bandas fans were on the second bound. Yeah. Um, the, the other meeting. Uh, sorry, I'm I'm digressing. But no, no. The other meeting um, that stands out, and I sadly wasn't there, even though I was co-promoter, was when we won the fours in 2012 at Peterborough. Uh, when we weren't fancy to win them at all, we'd won them in 2002 at Coventry. Mm. Uh, much to the disgust of Sky Sports, who were rooting for Kelvin, who was riding for Arena in the last race, <laughs> and, fin- and finished last. Uh, Paul Bentley won the last race to clinch the trophy for Berwick. That was 2002. In 2012, we'd had a stinker of a night the night before and got beat at home by Sheffield, so everybody was on a downer. So they went down to Peterborough and um, won the semi and won the final. Um, and, and Seb Alden produced the race of his life in the last race to come right through and win the race. Um, I think he only needed a second place anyways, but he won it. Huge, huge Berwick following on the first bend. Um, a good Berwick team. Um, you had Seb Alden, you had uh, Ricky Ashworth. Um, they were spearheading the team that day. Um and and they won the fours, so that was that was another highlight. Sorry about that. And I've still got the I've still got the trophy from that meeting. Have you really? <laughs> it was given to me for safekeeping. Yes, <laughs> it's still safe. <laughs> Lee Compton was in the team. Um, David Balego. Oh, of course. Yeah, he's doing all right these days as well, isn't he? Yeah, he is, yeah. Uh, he, he moved from Berwick to Swindon. Um, he was a Berwick asset. Uh, so it was Ricky Ashworth, David Balego, Lee Compton, Sebastian Alden, and. Um, the reserve was Alex Edberg. It's, sometimes when you get to my age, Ian, the memory's not what it used to be. <laughs> oh, don't worry, don't worry. Well, let's tell you what. Let's talk about the um, who would be the uh, the referee for for your match. And as an ex referee yourself, you uh, I think you can run the rule over some of them probably uh, better than most. Yeah, I mean, I get on great with the referees, uh, the current referees. You have to, haven't you? You know, I mean, yeah. um, I mean, I- I'm delighted how. I mean, I first got to know Paul Ackroyd, um, who was um, was refereeing a lot, and then to see how how his son Craig has um, progressed in Speedway. You know, from being a trainee, um, which I remember him as, and coming through to now be probably, in everybody's opinion, I think the top um, the top FIM referee now. You know, mm. to see how he's progressed and. There's a lot of new young lads coming through as well now, which is good to see. Um, but but I'll go back. I'll go back to my era if it's okay, and um, I'll nominate um, I'll nominate John Whitaker as the referee. One of the reasons being, John took me for my final referees test at Sheffield, which was the um, that meeting I was telling you about the um, Bass Yorkshire Open Championship. Yeah, and I can remember. In the box at Sheffield that night, there was another referee up from London on holiday, and, and John sat at the back of the box with the referee, and he said to me, "Just get on with the meeting. Just let me know if there are any hiccups." <laughs> <laughs> That's good, giving you a bit of autonomy though, and just giving uh, that reassurance so, to just um, crack on. Yeah, so that was um, that was John, and I, I got very friendly with John over the years, and he was still refereeing, obviously, and and then I always made a point of of going to speak to him when. Um, when I met up with him at Sheffield, when I was down, you know, um, with Berwick, you know, and uh, he, he certainly, he's always been um, part and parcel of, of my life in Speedway as John Whitaker, so I'm delighted uh, to name him as the referee. So that's the referee. Now, if you're going to change a rule of Speedway to in order to make it better, um, which rule would you tamper with if you could do whatever you wanted yeah, to the rule book? I would like to see that start and gate procedure I was telling you about earlier on in place. If it was humanly possible, have like a a box start and gate similar to what you would see in, like you said, greyhounds and horse racing. You know, yeah. I would like to see a num- I would like to see a number eight named every meeting if it was humanly possible to do that. And I mean, I was pleased to see the the IRR rule come in 
where if a rider got hurt during the meeting, you could bring in the injury replacement yeah. IRR rule. You know, you, you obviously you know what the ride the ride replacement rule has been in place for a few years, anyways. But the IRR rule came in during the meeting. You could you could replace a rider, but but only with the, a rider below him. I would like to see that maybe extended to include the rider above as well. You know, if you were using the IRR rule. Yeah. Um, also, like to see number eight named, and if if a chance one of your reserves got got ruled out of the meeting. Um, you could you could bring your number eight in as a reserve, like a reserve replacement. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Slot him in, uh, rather than putting pressure on one reserve and maybe going with three riders in one race. And so let's have a look now. At who would be your opposition then for your your team of all stars? Who would you choose the, to, to ride against your dream team? Do you think? Yeah. Well, again, I took the easy road out, and I've named an all-time British World Championship champions team. So I've named eight riders. So I've, mm. I've gone with Tommy Price, Freddie Williams, the late, great Peter Craven, Peter Collins, Michael Lee, Gary Havelock, Mark Loram, and Ty Woffenden. Well, wow, that's going to be a that's difficult eight one. eight race against Berwick at Berrington Lough track. Wow. At part of Hall Stadium. I think you'd certainly, uh, you'd certainly attract a decent crowd for that, Dennis. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, you would, wouldn't you? <laughs> and who'd, who'd be doing the announcing? Would that be you? Well, I, think, I think I'd put my name forward for that one, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I might look, even put my name forward as team manager for that one. <laughs> hey, why not? Well, you've, yeah, you, you've, you've had a successful time team managing, so you, you, know, you keep, that, keep that winning streak up, and you can't um, lose if you uh, pick both teams. No, that's true, yeah. I, I, I'm probably lucky. I, I got a couple of meetings where we were bang on song. I had Red Car one night where we won and travelled down to Plymouth the next night and we won again, so that was nice, you know. Yeah, great stuff. Well, it's been a fantastic time. It, uh, we've had um, chatting and, uh, and and a great contribution and, and entire life in Speedway, I think. You know, over 50 years is... Uh, is is a, is a great um, a great amount of time to to invest certainly largely of of that in in one club as well and uh, yeah. I, mu- I must apologise if I've made a couple of errors along the way because um, somebody maybe pick them up and tell me <laughs> but, uh, it happens doesn't it when you you try to remember everything over the years but I think basically we've got most of it right. Well, that's what counts. Um, but no, it's been fantastic, Dennis, and and, and thanks for um, thanks for joining us and and speaking to us about your your life in Speedway. Yeah, it's a pleasure. Ian. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. My thanks to Dennis McCleary for for joining us in this episode. And um, I don't think I've had uh, a guest before who's so universally loved from all corners of the country. When I posted about him on social media that he's going to be coming up and all that, people going, "Oh, he's such a lovely guy. I love Dennis." and and uh, of course, Berwick Bandits fans will will know Dennis's voice very, very well indeed. A fantastic chat with uh, Dennis McCleary, and check out some of the other previous episodes too, because there's um, plenty of other Berwick-related guests that we've had on actually in the past. Uh, Chris Morton uh, was the team manager there uh, at one point. Kelvin Tatum, who was in that uh, team that Dennis was talking about in the uh, the year that they really went for it and had a, a, a world-beating team, but it didn't quite work out. But Kelvin um, talks a little bit about Berwick in the episode we did with him which was from the back end of last year Gary Havelock of course uh, former team manager at Berwick uh, he's um, an episode that we did I think in October last year talking all about his time there and uh, many many more episodes besides as well took into them if you've not listened to them all yet and you're uh, one of the new followers there's loads to go at they're all still relevant they're not really out of date they're all uh, the story of, of the various individuals uh, concerned so check those out at your leisure and of course for the latest info follow us on our our social media channels we are at speedway humans on twitter you can follow me directly i'm at ian brannan plus we're also on facebook and instagram and uh, of course you can check out all of the previous episodes too on the sport social website sport-social.co.uk where you can check out more episodes of humans of speedway and uh, plenty of other great sporting podcasts too and until the next episodes then stay safe and uh, we'll speak soon on humans of speedway This podcast is part of the Sports Social Podcast Network. Sports Social Podcast Network.
Looking for a fun way to win up to 25 times your money this basketball season? Test your skills on Prize Picks, the most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. Just select two or more players, pick more or less on their projection for a wide variety of stats, and place your entry. It's as easy as that. If you have the skills, you can turn $10 into $250 with just a few taps. Easy gameplay, quick withdrawals, and injury insurance on your picks are what make Prize Picks the number one daily fantasy sports app. Ready to test your skills? Join the Prize Picks community of more than 7 million players who have already signed up. Right now, Prize Picks will match your first deposit up to $100. Just visit prizepicks.com slash get100 and use code get100. That's code get100 at prizepicks.com slash get100 for a first deposit matchup to $100. Prize Picks, daily fantasy sports made easy.